Thank you, Felice. Um, it has been a great labor with um, myself, certainly with the Mufrej family, who I really appreciate all of the all of the work that that all of you have done with me to support the kind of possibility of of making this show a reality is so so deeply appreciated. And so, thank you very much. Um, also, a, a big thanks to, to Felice, to my other colleagues here at the Contemporary Arts Museum, and to our supporters um, for doing the, all the legwork and all the behind the scenes things that happen in order to pull an exhibition like this together. Um, it's also exciting to have my colleague Larissa Harris here, who is a curator from Queens Museum in New York. The exhibition will travel um, this in about a year from now. Um, to Queen's Museum, so that's a, a really exciting thing. Um, I will kind of start off just by giving you a little bit of background. How I came to the work um, is that I had visited an exhibition at the Gray Art Gallery at New York University in 2006 called The Downtown Show. It included work by a lot of artists who were active doing performance, doing sculpture, video, photography, dance, um, in the East Village and downtown Manhattan. Um, I'm a bit of a research junkie, I suppose, and so I often will kind of look at announcements for exhibitions by folks who are maybe better known individuals who, like David Wanarovich or Keith Haring, who were all colleagues and, and contemporaries of Nicholas's and kind of start to do research about individuals. You know, when you look at a show where Keith Haring is one artist among 14 or 17 other people, it's really fun for me to kind of go back and, and start to look at, okay, who are all of these artists? Who are their contemporaries? And who are the people that we, we might not remember as well? Um, that was certainly the case for me seeing Nicholas's work when I saw it in the, in the Gray Art Gallery at NYU. He was not someone who was familiar to me at that point. And what I did was started to kind of research one of the very first things that I found, and probably one of the most important, was that I saw an, an obituary that was written by Roberta Smith in the New York Times when Nicholas passed in 1985. As a, it was a beautifully written um, obituary that kind of talked about his importance to the community, his activities, but also really recognized not only the writing that he was doing at the time, because he was indeed well known to many people who were active in New York as a writer and critic, um, but also a, a deep appreciation of the art that he was making. It also was not lost on me that you don't just get a write-up like that in the New York Times by their head art critic, um, so that felt like something really important. It mentioned um, that Nicholas was survived by a brother and sister who were in Shreveport, and I was very lucky when I reached out to Nuna and to Nabil, um, and then had so much support from Hanan as well, and basically said, okay, do you guys know about what work might be around? And you never know what's gonna happen in a moment like that. You know, it could be that there's a painting or two. It could be also that you're not gonna find anything, that you know, an individual could be estranged. Um, indeed, it was quite the opposite. Um, Nicholas was so deeply loved by his family and so deeply supported. And I got, and we're talking about 2005, 2006, when putting a digital image in an email and sending it was still a bit of a feat. <laughs> and I remember getting a series of six or seven emails from Nabil that were just full of images of Nicholas's paintings hung in dining rooms and living rooms, in Nabil's office, in family rooms, e everywhere. And it was very clear to me very early on that this was work that was also deeply cared for. So it, it also makes me really proud to have the opportunity to, to kind of take that care and, and really show, uh, have an opportunity to show, you know, how important this work is um, these many years later. Um, the exhibition also, Nicholas had a very peripatetic lifestyle. 
Um, he was born to Lebanese family in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, did quite a bit of, of moving back and forth, but essentially was raised in Beirut. Um, in, and the, we follow the kind of movements that he made over time um, through the exhibition. So the exhibition, kind of roughly, um, these are our works that were earlier works. So the works that you see on the wall and in the cases are a kind of introduction to the artist. You get to see a little bit with these incredible embroidered paintings that he's making um, where they start. So in the case, there is a, a small early tapestry that although is undated, I would say is probably around 1972, 73. There's also a drawing in there. And you see that it starts off like many other drawings that were kind of made during that period, um, influenced by psychedelia, say, that there's a, a sense for me of the way that he's working is, um, there's a, a fluidity to it. He starts kind of doing something and then is able to elaborate and build a kind of drawing. Um, the one that we have in there is a drawing on marker. It also strikes me that you see his gift for working with color. Um, so with that marker drawing and with the, the early tapestry work that's behind it, you see this kind of vibrant color, but also really vibrant textures. And for me, the, the two paintings or tapestries that are displayed above it function a little bit like samplers. You also see him kind of working with um, different materials, with wool, with silk, with cotton, and establishing different kinds of textures, both in some of those black buildings, when you start to get up close, they really, re the works I feel really re reward close looking um, because you start to be able to slow down and see the way that these, that these works are built um, bit by bit and stitch by stitch, essentially. Um, as we kind of start to swing around and look at these works, um, one of the things that is also fairly striking to me is that with this work um, directly in front of us, um, which is called Le Sang de Phoenix or The Blood of the Phoenix, it's notable, I think, that it's the exact same composition um, as this work here. So this is um, Nikki from 1978. This one is Le Sang de Phoenix, The Blood of the Phoenix from 1975. Um, 1975 is also the beginning of the Civil War in Lebanon, which we know lasted until 1990 and had repercussions much later. Um, but for me, kind of thinking about Nicholas, who in 1975 left Beirut for Paris to work there, it's, it strikes me that, and although I don't know, but it's, it ultimately feels like something that is Nicholas really thinking about the place that he left and certainly the people that he would have left behind. Um, up in the top right corner, the red and white and green symbol that you see is the cedar that appears on the Lebanese flag. Um, down in the bottom, this kind of fist, a, a kind of classic image from um, opposition, war movements, things like that. Um, and so certainly, it's him thinking about that. One of the things that I also think is, is important is like this idea of these figures that are left behind is for me a bit reflected in something that's maybe not so easy to see in this composition as it is here, but you have him playing around um, and creating the bottom part of a, of a facial profile. And so certainly this idea of, of folks who might be thinking in our thoughts um, is also reflected for me in the, the eyes that are kind of floating in the sky. This idea of, of thinking, trying to think through that space um, and be connected to a space that one might have left under, you know, some sense of, of duress. So the move that he makes, as I mentioned, is from Beirut to Paris. And if we, you can walk through that way or this way, the works in this back space are works that, that Nicholas made in Paris. Um, 
He spent time in Paris from about um, 1975 to 1980. Um, and what interests me, um, and what I think is particularly important about this work, is that in, um, th during the time that Nicholas is in Paris is the first time that I've found in his notes he begins referring to the work that he's making as paintings. Um, I think it's significant because I think what he's doing is looking at European painting traditions. And so certainly you have figures um, like this Laokawan figure um, or others um, that are coming from um, prints, classical prints um, by folks like Marcello Minelli here. Um, there are others, references to um, works by Claude Lorraine, a number of European artists. But then what he's doing that I think is also particularly interesting is combining those with references that would have not been so familiar to European painting audiences. And so the, the patterning that comes from Islamic tile work design, also other symbols that are coming from a broad variety of religious and cultural um, backgrounds. So you see um, like next to this figure here, um, this kind of papyrus, which comes out of Egyptian artworks. The two lions that you see in the, in the top of that work are Syrian. Um, the figures though, the, the small house and tree come out of a painting by Claude Lorraine. Um, the figure here is from um, Antonio Raimondi. So it's combining these kind of different traditions. Um, it's also, you know, we see the, the alpha and the omega appear quite, quite often. Um, over here, we have the alpha, the omega, the aleph. Someone told me last night that they think that this K looking letter down at the bottom is actually an Etruscan A. So he's pulling from all over from different cultural traditions. And I think that that kind of sense of, of intellect that's in the work and this kind of real curiosity about other cultures is something that I think is very present in this work. I think the other thing that's pretty significant is that we also never see, or rarely, um, at, and at least in all of the, the images that we have here, you don't see the faces of these figures. They're always bodies that are turned away from us. We're seeing them from the back. Um, there are the one or two in which you do see faces. We just don't have them exhibited here. But that for me is also this kind of figure on the, on the brink of something. Um, always kind of looking in at these fantastic landscapes, at new places, new lands, but being on that border. And certainly as somebody who is going to Paris, moving to a new place, like we all have that experience of being in a new place and kind of feeling a bit tentative, feeling about, you know, trying to figure out how do you fit into this place. And for me, these figures are really representative of, of that sense of kind of trying to step into a, a new realm and kind of find one's footing in, in those new places. Um, it's also, I think, you know, when you start to look closer at some of these, some really great things happen. You start to see, um, it's significant for me that in Paris, um, the scale of the work increases a great deal. I think it, that is certainly for me a reference to kind of European painting traditions and easel painting traditions. Um, but you also see that what he's doing is stretching an embroidery canvas. Um, so not a, a traditional painting substrate over these stretcher bars. And it enables a kind of um, transparency to happen um, so like on this one, it's a really great moment and you can take a chance to look at it closer where you start to see the shadows on the wall of the figure and it's almost like it looks like a, an x-ray or something. Um, it's like it gives the figures a, a sense of volume that I think is really important um, and that's, that's a really incredible thing to see. It's also really fun to see how um, Nicholas was really playing. So over here, um, in this case, 
you see some um, Xeroxes that he had made, that he made some line drawings atop of, very similar to the way that he elaborates the figures then um, with chain stitching around, the, around the, the paintings of the figures that are on the canvases. And here, a really beautiful one, um, a photograph of the letters that appear at the bottom, a Xerox of the, the drawing or the, the print um, that this figure comes from and some drawing around it um, that shows where this idea for including this, this um, volcano in the, in the work was generated from. It's also really great to see a piece like this, which is actually not a finished work, um, but it came out of one of the books and you can kind of see how he would have started to plan color and how a drawing, especially one that maybe includes a bit of, of shading on some of the, the objects that are in it, um, would have kind of suggested how he would go back in and begin to stitch color in. Um, so if we look at, say, a painting over here, like first step into the pyramid, I think what's really beautiful is we look at this thing and you know, when you think about painting, when painters are working kind of wet into wet, and mixing paint colors um, by just pulling the brush through a variety of different colors. It's something that I think we're oftentimes familiar with, that, that sense of blending, but we don't often get to see something that is as elaborate as this, where you know I've tried to start counting the, the number of different colors of green and yellow and blue that are in here, and I got up to, I thought, maybe about 14 or 15 at one point, but totally lost track. But amazing to think about somebody kind of using this palette of embroidery thread to basically build up really painterly surfaces. Um, that, that, I think, is really special. And then also to see the ways that, that some of these figures are, the painting is not so thick, but more a kind of stain that's applied onto the, onto the embroidery, embroidery canvas. So as we kind of start to swing around then, um, these are works that were made in Paris between 1975 and 1980, roughly. Um, the works out here, except for the work on the middle wall here, are works that were produced um, when Nicholas was in New York between um, 1980 and 1985. And if we kind of begin to imagine um, that Nicholas was borrowing things from other figures, from other prints and paintings, um, kind of quote, making quotations of things that were coming out of European painting traditions, one of the things that's also important for us to kind of remember historically is that the moment that he gets to New York in 1980, there's a movement called appropriation. And this was artists kind of taking things from other artists, borrowing them, but oftentimes kind of even just making direct copies of things. They were questioning ideas about originality, about um, authorship, and doing it in ways that that I think Nicholas really establishes himself as someone who's also participating in dialogues around appropriation, but doing it in, we had a, I had a conversation last night with Tim Cohn about the way in which Nicholas brings very personal information into it, and I think it's one of the things that allows the work to remain so fresh. I mean, ultimately, I think lots of people are surprised hearing that the works were made you know, from, it, from the 70s and 80s, because it looks like a lot of work that artists are, are thinking about and making currently. Um, and so when we start to kind of think about the ways that these appropriations function on multiple levels, um, this is a, a really incredible work. Um, you'll notice also when you start to look at the works, some of the works we do know titles, um, some of the works we do know dates, but unless we know beyond a shadow of a doubt through notations that Nicholas made, and those are things that I've found on, written on slides, um, appearing in magazines in which the works have appeared, or even just sometimes on notations that the artist has made, um, 
we basically kind of stick to what we know to be true. So sometimes we know titles, sometimes we know dates, sometimes it's, it's ultimately a best guess. Um, this is kind of one of those cases where we know the, the work is from 1985. Um, the title escapes us, but ultimately I think when we start to talk about these ideas of, of layers of appropriation, this one is a really interesting one because we have a painting by Fragonard, who's an artist working in the Rococo tradition in France, um, that has already kind of been affected a change because it's been printed as an embroidery kit, something that you would buy in a, in a kind of embroidery store or a sewing notion store. Um, it includes a, a kind of series of different colors of embroidery thread that you would need to purchase in order to kind of finish sewing this work. It's not lost on me that what this woman is doing is carving an initial into a tree. We imagine, because it's called Le Chiffre d'Amour, the, the letter of love, it might be the letter of, of somebody that she cares about. So interesting to see that, but then very interesting to see that what Nicholas does is to actually put his name over top of it, sewing it directly. So it's almost as though he's kind of tagged the Fragonard painting in a way. Then there's a whole other level of that happening, um, both because we also have these Egyptian cartouches. It was pointed out to me yesterday that Egyptian cartouches often were the names of individuals and things like that. So, and also referencing his kind of cultural diversity um, as someone who was Lebanese born in Alexandria, Egypt. But then we also have yet another layer um, which is that we have this copy of a Roy Lichtenstein um, painting called Spray Paint from 1962, if I'm remembering correctly, although don't quote me on that. But I think, again, here you see this idea that, you know, the M and this, in the spray painting, so it's kind of like triple tagged. And I think what's significant here as well is that this is a work that was included in an exhibition at Fun Gallery um, that Nicholas had in 19, um, 1984-85. And Fun Gallery was a gallery located in the East Village in New York. It was actually well known because one of the things, or one of the, the things that they did was that they were showing graffiti artists at the time. So folks like Lady Pink, Lee Quinones, um, there were, um, Fab Five Freddy, Keith Haring. So that, that kind of notion of, you know, now it's not so strange for us to think about graffiti as art, but at that point, those distinctions were pretty clear cut between what was kind of considered official or high art and what wasn't. And I think Nicholas's excitement about showing in a gallery that was showing graffiti art is certainly kind of exists for me in, in this, this combination of images. Um, in the same way, um, in this diptych, uh, which is called music, you again see the, these kind of idea of where Nicholas might have been, places that he moved through over time. So again, Egypt, again with this, the reference to this Renoir, painting um, called Young Girls at a Piano. Um, Renoir, obviously a, a French artist, um, and then a copy of a, a Liechtenstein painting, a partial copy of it, called His Melody Haunts My Reverie. And so, and we start to also see that Nicholas had a really great sense of humor, a real, a real kind of intelligence and wit about things, and I think that combination of, of images together really starts to, starts to create a, a kind of musicality and the painting really sings in a way. Um, as we kind of start to swing up this way, you also see that not only is he kind of thinking about this sense of humor, but also about kind of cultural and political issues. And again, this sense of kind of breaking down these boundaries between high art and low art, 
These are things that, that at that time were very important to folks. I think it's really great to see that these days, less and less, we're having these kind of distinctions between you know, what's officially art, what's not art, what's art, what's craft. It's nice to see those boundaries breaking down, but certainly at the time Nicholas was making this work, it would have been really challenging for a lot of folks to see somebody making these works in embroidery, which would have already had a kind of connotation of not being high art, um, but then also bringing in things like references to comic books as well. Again, something that at the time would have been, would have been maybe thought of as, as not so, not so um, proper for a kind of piece of, of high art. It's really great to see also the way that he's talking about other issues. So political issues are, are kind of very present. Um, in this work, um, which is called The Weather Last Tuesday, you see this kind of figure, um, a boy maybe listening to a ham radio in the center. Certainly when this work was made in 1985, um, the war in Beirut, in Lebanon, would have still been um, kind of, I mean, we would have been at a, at a pretty terrible moment. And so this sense of kind of how do, you, how do you listen, how do you know what's going on with family, with friends, with folks that one is, is caring about from far away, listening to the radio, trying to tune in and maybe hear stories. Um, and indeed, I think Nuna and Nabil have talked about how difficult it had been to kind of be in contact um, via telephone or other ways with family to know what was happening to people who were there. But then you also see some kind of clear references to the war. Um, Picasso's Guernica is quoted in here. Picasso's Guernica being a, one of the kind of most famous anti-war paintings by Picasso, made I believe in 1937. Thank you. Um, but then you also see some other figures that I think are maybe a little bit more surprising. So Spider-Man, is for me a kind of clear stand-in, a self-portrait figure that represents Nicholas. Um, these kind of Arabic letters that you see are, not, are the word nam. Um, in Arabic is the word for yes, but it also happens to be his um, initials, Nicholas Abdullah Mufarej. And so you often see kind of Spider-Man swinging in on the tail end of that calligraphy. It's interesting as well that, you know, if we kind of start to think back to Nicholas's interest in classical information, that the figure of Arachne, who in classical art is kind of, is weaving the men's histories, also the Arachne being the spider and Spider-Man. So there's a, a very clear kind of connection for me there. But then also the other one that's maybe a little bit more funny and surprising is the Santa Claus. And for me, again, it's this sense of, of, of humor. So Santa Claus being Saint Nicholas, Nicholas Mufarej, there's, there's that connection as well. And indeed here you see this other Saint Nicholas figure um, with the, the initials Nam kind of coming out of what appears to be a cauldron but which is also a kind of inkwell with a, a quill pen kind of behind it. So another kind of reference to the writing that Nicholas was doing in addition to the art that he was creating. Um, here I think is probably one of my kind of favorite moments. You also see the initials Nam appearing again, this time connected to the torch of the Statue of Liberty. Um, and then just a really great moment, this Spider-Man in a hall of mirrors, so being reflected over and over again, and the, the Santa Claus or Saint Nicholas um, being reflected in that mirror. I think also one of the things that's important to kind of think about is the materiality and the physicality of these works. Um, at the time, I think a lot of work that was being done in appropriation was a bit more austere a bit more kind of stripped down, a bit more minimal. And so the appearance of this kind of glitter or indeed even of, of brooches um, and costume jewelry that are being pinned to the surfaces are also really significant. Things that would have kind of stood out, but things that also in their way fit in. 
when we're thinking about the East Village in the 1980s and what artists and folks there were doing, people were getting dressed up and wanting to kind of like give themselves a little glitter and glamour in order to kind of, you know, go out. And there are great pictures of, of Nicholas, you know, with beautiful brooches kind of pinned onto blazers that he was wearing, looking like very handsome and turned out. Um, and it was also beautiful to see a collection of those brooches that the family wore last night. Um, but these kind of things, you know, in the moment that they were happening were, I think, would have really stood out and kind of maybe pushed people into a, into a, a place that might not have been so comfortable at least artistically, but I think that those kind of challenges are the really productive challenges that allow this work to kind of remain so fresh for us today. I think then if we kind of look at the, at the back wall here, um, these are a series of, of works that all quote Roy Lichtenstein, who is an artist that was very important to Nicholas. Um, these are actually some of Nicholas's books, um, some Roy Lichtenstein books, some copies that, that Nicholas would have made from actually some of these books that you'll see if you look at them that they appear in other areas. Um, the only thing that is not Nicholas's in here is a postcard, but I'll get to that when I kind of describe some of the works. And so I think, you know, what we see here is when we think about appropriation um, and when we think about an artist like Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein is already copying somebody else. So what he's doing is taking things that he's finding in comic books or indeed Disney comics, um, like appears in, in one of the works over there, um, and reproducing them again. So you're looking at things like, oh Jeff, I love you too, but that clearly comes out of a comic book. And so we have Lichtenstein taking that comic and then kind of giving it another layer by just repainting it. So that kind of appropriation that Mufarej makes by taking Lichtenstein, which is all, so it's already a copy of a copy of a copy and kind of repositioning re it, it's a really great way and I think kind of reflects the, the real sense of intellect and wit that he has in kind of combining these images. There is, for me, also a, a real sense of, of emotion that he's able to imbue in the images. And so you have a figure like this um, that, that comes from a Lichtenstein painting from 1963 or 64. I don't care, I'd rather sink than call Brad for help. So copying that, but then also adding in this um, this wave that comes from a Yukioe woodblock print by the artist Hokusai that was from Japan from a series that he made called 53 Views of Mount Fuji that include these real stylized waves. And so this idea that already, which is a kind of pretty emotional thing, this woman kind of sinking, perhaps getting ready to drown, and this wave kind of coming in ready to deliver the, the coup de grace that maybe kind of sinks her is something that for me is, is poignant in this work. It's also important to think about the fact that he, what he's doing already is kind of mixing Eastern and Western traditions there, um, mixing kind of layers of things, mixing a kind of modern artwork with something that's quite a bit more historical. Hokusai would have made those in the 18, 18 yeah, late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, and then other works that kind of appear in them. Um, the Edvard Munch's The Scream, which many of you will be familiar with because it's also been reproduced all over the place, although I can't say that I've ever actually seen the real work myself. Um, on the, the painting in the middle juxtaposes a Lichtenstein with an Andy Warhol paint by numbers. So again, Warhol kind of already appropriating a paint by numbers and these multiple layers of appropriation, layering these things up. We should also say that the, the layering and the structure of these is also another reference to another artist, um, Mondrian, 
who many of you will know, um, for his kind of stripped back red, black, and blue kind of gridded compositions. Um, there are some actually that are up right now at the, in the Menil collection, which is a, a great thing to see. Um, but then we have another kind of appropriation here. So this black and white image that appeared in this catalog, it was um, something that Nicholas probably would have received from, Cast it's, there's a, a sticker on the back from Leo Castelli Gallery. So this would have been something that as somebody who is writing for press, he would have got from the gallery kind of as a, as a you know, something that a magazine or newspaper might consider reproducing. But again, here we have these multiple layers of the way that the image has been mediated. So you have Lichtenstein copying a Mondrian painting. Um, Lichtenstein's painting itself is actually a, a full color painting. So blue and red and white and black, but then the gallery kind of photographing it and making it black and white to be able to kind of distribute for press purposes. And so all of these things, kind of thinking about these layers of, of the way that these objects are structured and the layers of kind of places where these images have come from is really, is really important. Um, the thing that I mentioned, the postcard that's in there, is, um, which appears in the bottom corner, is a work by Eve Klein. Um, Klein's work actually also is in the Menil collection. Um, some of you may have seen it before the Menil closed um, for their, their new reinstall and reopening. That work actually had been hanging in their galleries for a while. And what Klein was doing um, at the time was these pieces where he would paint women's bodies in a color that he had called International Klein Blue. It was his kind of official cobalt that he used almost as a, a signature of his own. He would paint them, have them lay down on canvas almost to make a print of their bodies, and then spray paint around them with the same blue pigment. Um, and so you see here the, the image of that painting, which as you can imagine is quite large because it's seven people kind of laying across a canvas. It's also really interesting to see here again to kind of just point out one of the material issues that some of these, um, the stitches that, that are in here go horizontal, others go vertical, and so it makes it seem as though they're two different colors of purple, but indeed it's just kind of one color and if you start to move around a little bit it shows you that it's actually um, part of his facility with the materials. And, and making those making those jumps. And then the, the last work here, I think is also significant for me. It includes a, self, a piece by um, Lichtenstein called Self-Portrait. Um, so his Self-Portrait is just a, a painting of a t-shirt with a mirror above it. And it's a, it's a kind of roughly rendered mirror, but here, it becomes another self-portrait on another level because Nicholas brings some of these figures um, that appear in the works that, that were being made um, during that time in Paris and kind of juxtaposing those two. So in a way, almost kind of inserting himself back into this scene and making it function as a, a self-portrait on multiple levels. Um, it's also really great to see with works like this, like the, the transparency that I was talking about and the way that the, that the figure kind of casts a shadow onto the back wall kind of doubles the, the idea of the figure yet again in a physical and not just metaphorical way. Um, I don't know if folks have any questions about any of the, any of the work. It's also really great that we have the family here. They know probably as much, if not more, than I do. Um, yes, yeah, so Ruth, actually over in the front, um, we managed to find, um, Nicholas trained as a, as a chemist, 
and did studies in chemistry as an undergraduate and graduate at American University in Beirut. He got a Fulbright scholarship to go on a teaching assistantship to Harvard University in 1969. So he was in Cambridge, um, and basically while he was there, got a, the story is that he got a hole in his jeans. He probably would have went to a five and dime looking for a patch, didn't find a patch that he particularly liked, and thought, oh, I can make one myself. And so he embroidered a small patch in the shape of a strawberry put it on, and I imagine probably got instantly lots of compliments, how great this object looked. And so he started making patches um, and giving them away to friends, apparently also sold a few of them. Um, and that kind of started, I think, a, an interest in drawing. And indeed, I think about the embroidery as a kind of slow drawing, because it is like using a line you know, the, one, the way that one might draw a line with a pen or a pencil, but it, a physical line that's just passing through the fabric over and over again. And so I think there's a, a really great photograph of a patch on the, back, on the back of a pocket of a pair of jeans and a picture of, of Nicholas wearing those same jeans in Cambridge in 1970. Yeah. Other questions? Excellent. Well, thanks everyone so much for coming. Appreciate it.